So welcome to our Invasive Aquatic Plants webinar today. I am Dr. Katherine Clements and our guest speaker is Dr. Abby Turna. And this is the sixth part of our Invasive Species webinar series. Next. Here's a little bit about Dr. Abby. She led a team of over 18 UF faculty and researchers to create and run the statewide Healthy Ponds Certification Program, a holistic education program for pond managers that provides up to 24 CEUs for aquatic pesticide applicators. She grew up in Southwest Florida playing in the swamps and has academic training in wetland science and management. So she will be our guest speaker today. And after I do the introduction, she will take over and talk to you all about invasive aquatic plants. Next. I'm Dr. Katherine Clements and I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension, Sarasota County. And I have spent a long time in environmental education and sandwiched in the middle of that career. I also had a career as a physician. I started here at UF FIFAS Extension in 2017 and do a lot of programming in Florida's ecology, wildlife, and native and invasive plants. Next. And we just like to tell you a little bit about Extension in case you're new to us. Uh, Extension is a partnership between the county, the University of Florida and the USDA, which is the US Department of Agriculture. There is an Extension office in every county, all 67 counties in the state of Florida. And they are very, uh, very specific to the county they're in. So we have a quite a large uh, staff and faculty here at our Sarasota County Extension office. And we are a mix between urban agriculture and rural lands here. So we have programming that addresses all of those categories. Uh, the Extension Office uses university research and resources to address the local needs of our community. And we are an educational facility. So we are here to provide education and assistance to our Sarasota County residents and community. Next. And these are just some of the programs that we do here at our Sarasota County Extension Office. Uh, I'm there in the Ecology and Natural Resources side, Abby's in the Water Resources side, uh, but we have lots of other programs. Next. Here are some of the logos that are specific community programs that we do that you may be familiar with. Abby and I are both involved in the Florida Master Naturals Program, which is in your upper right-hand corner. And that program is an amazing adult education program through University of Florida IFAS uh, that teaches all about Florida's ecology. And Abby and I run the freshwater uh, wetlands course as well as the invasive plant course. And we teach many of the other courses as well. Abby also is involved in the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project that's down there in the bottom. And the Lake Watch program as well, which she can tell you more about. Oh, and the Florida Water Stewardship Program. So she can tell you more about those uh, later if she'd like. Next. So this is what we're going to do today. And if you've been on our other invasive species series webinars, uh, the first 15 to 20 minutes is pretty much the same for all of the webinars because we always have new people joining us. And then I will do that part and then I will turn it over to Abby. And that's going to be all the new stuff about the aquatic plants that she'll be sharing with you. So I'm going to go into definitions and impacts right now. Next. Next. All right, so if you aren't familiar with the terminology around invasive species, uh, University of Florida IFAS uh, put out this article in the Journal of Extension in June of last year. And this was really trying to not only synthesize the terminology that's used in the invasive species community, but also standardize it so that we're all starting to use the same language because there's this is such a national and worldwide really problem. It's not just specific to Florida or Sarasota County. It's certainly not specific even to our own country. So we have lots of different agencies working on this issue and we found that a lot of different terms were being used. And so we tried to standardize it for the, the scientific and public community so that we were all using the same language. So a native species is a species that occurs naturally in a specified geographic area. 
Um, usually that means they've been here for hundreds or even thousands of years in Florida from a botanical perspective. We usually consider those plants as being native that were here prior to European settlement. A non-native species is a species that does not occur naturally in a specified geographic area, and that usually means it was introduced or brought to a new geographic area either intentionally or unintentionally by humans. And we'll talk a little bit more about introduction in a while. And then an established species is a species having a self-sustaining and reproducing population in a specified area without the need for human intervention. So sometimes those introduced species that are brought into a new area do not become established. They just can't survive or reproduce and create a viable population. But sometimes they do become established, which is one of the first steps to potentially becoming an invasive plant. Next. So invasive species, in this case, we're going to talk aquatic plants, but whether we're talking plants or animals, an invasive species has three distinctions. It is non-native to a specified geographic area. It is introduced by humans, once again, either intentionally or unintentionally, and it can cause environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. And so in order to be considered invasive, a species has to fulfill all of those categories. So a non-native species isn't always invasive. Sometimes non-native species will be introduced into an area and they will not cause environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. And they are just sort of coexisting in our environment. Or there still may be a possibility for that non-native species to develop into what would be considered an invasive. And then a nuisance species is um, a group or individuals of the species that cause issues with property damage or they're annoying. They may be what we sometimes call aggressive. They may be overgrowing. And this can apply to both native and non-native species. And one of the native nuisance species that I often think of is something like grapevine, where grapevine can really overgrow an area, it can shade out other plants, and it can become what we would consider a nuisance plant, although it is actually native to our area. And then the last term I'm going to share is range change. This has to do with the circumstance of a species current range sort of expanding or shifting over time. And this is becoming more and more important for us to talk about as we think about climate change. And that as our climate changes and perhaps things become warmer, um, some of these species, both native and invasive species, may be able to change and expand their range into new territories. And those are some of the things that are being talked about in the invasive species community as we try to, uh, to think about that and be proactive and plan for that ahead of time. Next. So we have just a few definitions. Uh, that are interesting to think about. This is from the USDA uh, NRCS, which is a Natural Resource Conservation Service branch of the USDA. And they, they said a non-native plant that does not need human help to reproduce and maintain itself over time in an area where it is not native is considered naturalized. So even though their offspring reproduce and spread naturally, these plants that we're considering naturalized do not over time become native. Um, so if it's non-native, it's always considered non-native. Next, and potentially invasive. These are some of the other terms that um, are still sometimes used. And these are some of the terms that we were trying to get away from by standardizing the language because some of these also have, uh, have misinterpreted um, or not, not good meanings that we want to be utilizing. So alien, foreign, introduced, non-indigenous, or exotic um, are some of those terms that can become confusing or misleading or just inappropriately used. So we really want to start talking about non-native or invasive or native. Next. 
And this is actually a legal definition. So a noxious weed is any plant or plant product that can directly or indirectly injure or cause damage to more of our agricultural type interests, as well as irrigation, navigation, or in general, natural resources of the US. And so this is actually, there's a noxious weed list. It is actually a legal list um, that when things are categorized, categorized as noxious weeds, they are actually prohibited from use. Next. And I know Wilma Holly, our Florida friendly landscaping person who does uh, many of these webinars with us, she just loves this um, term and how we are using this term. And it's just an interesting way to think about invasive plants as biological pollution. And so the National Park Service utilized this term and this quote is, some exotics are capable of hybridizing with native plant relatives. So for instance, if you think about lantana, um, this results in unnatural changes to a plant's genetic makeup. Still others contain toxins that may be lethal to certain animals. And so exotic organisms have been referred to as biological pollution. In some cases, exotic plant invaders are driving our rarest species species closer to extinction. So just a different way to think about this. Next. And then thinking about once again, when a, a non-native species is brought in, once it is introduced, if it becomes established, then it's just, it's always introduced. It's not considered native at any point, and at some point those non-native introduced species can become invasive and cause more problems. So the National Park Service said European settlers brought hundreds of plants to North America. Introductions continue today and are increasing due to an exploding human population. So many introduced plants have become naturalized across the continent and some are replacing North American native plant species. Next. So why do we want to prioritize native plants? So native plants have co-evolved over thousands of years with, uh, with the ecosystem they are in, with the plants and animals that are there, and they provide habitat for a lot of those animals. They are preferred food for our native organisms. So there's a whole story that we're not going to get into today, but there's a whole story about how our non-native milkweeds are actually causing increased parasitic infections to our monarch butterflies, as well as potentially shifting their migration patterns, which is causing problems in their long-term uh, survival. So some small change like that can make a huge difference in the overall um, health of a species that is dependent on that native plant. So we really want to think about prioritizing native plants to help save our wildlife as well. They also provide soil health and stability that often the non-native and invasive plants don't. They provide ecosystem services to us, which I'm sure we're going to talk about today. And there's also a cultural value to maintaining our native plant biodiversity. Next. So we're gonna talk about the impacts of the invasive species issue, some of the problems they cause, why it is such a problem in Florida, and then we'll turn it over to Abby in a few minutes. Next. So Wonderland has identified almost 5,000 plant species that exist in Florida. And out of that, almost 5,000, 1,500 are non-native plant species. That's about 31% of the plants that are currently found in Florida are not native to Florida. And although that, that is an issue in my opinion, uh, more of an issue is the number of invasive plants because these are the ones that are really causing ecosystem or economic harm. So invasive plants represent only 4% of that total number of almost 5,000 plants found in Florida. Yet what you wanna pay attention to is that they actually comprise one third of the total plant biomass growing in Florida. So invasive plants are a small number of plants here, 
but they make up a third of the actual mass of plant material here in Florida. And that's because part of their strategy that allows them to become invasive is they grow in monocultures. They take over large areas and crowd out the native species. Um, so this is, although there's only 4% of invasive plants, they take up a lot of the actual mass. Um, and there are reports that have also estimated that over 90% of Florida's public, um, public waterways are affected as well. Next. And part of the problem with invasive plants is easy access and no borders. Plants don't know the borders that us humans have created geographically. So 85% of non-native plants in the United States come through the Port of Miami. 25,000 plants are introduced every year purposely or inadvertently. And you can see an unintentional possibility for introduction here in the picture where um, plants are wrapped around that boat mo motor. And if people are not cleaning their boats or their four wheelers or their trucks when they go through areas and then travel to different areas, they are unintentionally spreading those invasive species. We have some of the largest ports in the country uh, we also have a large aquarium landscape, nursery and forest trade, and many non-natives come in through those different commercial ventures. Um, also invasive plants can come from other areas in the ballast waters of ships, which are often pumped out into the waterways where the ships have then come to um, and can carry things from other places. They can be transported as we just talked about and sometimes travelers bring back souvenir plants as well. Next. And non-native plants love Florida. It's a tropical or subtropical climate through most of peninsular Florida. There's vast agricultural holdings which often uh, create a wonderful place for invasive plants to take over. Disturbed land um, like plowed land for instance or land along the edge of roadsides. Those are great places where invasive plants usually are able to uh, grow and take hold. Out-of-state landowners often are not aware of this issue or are not in the state to take care of their land and get rid of the invasive plants. So sometimes that's an area where invasive plants take hold as well. And uh, we have a greater urban wildland interface that is continuing to grow in our state as we continue to develop and push our residential and commercial areas up against our natural areas. And then if you're planning something that you think is a wonderful landscape plant or something that you remember from where you used to live before and you bring it down here and you plant it in your backyard, uh, it's much easier for those plants to escape into natural areas or into some of our stormwater ponds, for instance. Next. Um, so invasives have a number of strategies that allow them to compete against our native plants and often overcome them. Uh, they also have these strategies that just allow them to grow really well in our state. So often they have a strategy of being able to grow rapidly as well as reproducing rapidly and having multiple generations in a growing season. Um, often some of these plants have a high fecundity, meaning lots of offspring, or when we're talking about plants, lots of seeds, for instance. Um, they often will have behavioral plasticity, meaning these plants can tolerate a wide range of conditions, such as they might have um, tolerance to salinity, they might have tolerance to drought or tolerance to um, hydrate, hydrated soils when uh, hurricanes come through and things like that. So they're able to live in a wide range of conditions. And often these plants will have a lack of their native predators or diseases that would have kept the population at bay in their native lands. And so when they're brought here, um, that pest or insect or disease that sort of kept their population in check is not necessarily here in Florida and they're able just to overgrow rapidly. Next. Another quote from the National Park Service, invasive non-native organisms are one of the greatest threats to the natural ecosystems of the US and are destroying America's natural history and identity. 
These unwelcome plants, insects, and other organisms are disrupting the ecology of our natural ecosystems, displacing native plant and animal species, and degrading our nation's unique and diverse biological resources. Um, so it's really important just to think about um, the biodiversity and the impact of these plants on overall biodiversity, which is directly linked in research to human health as well. Next. So invasive species, these are some of the dangers. As I've mentioned, they outcompete our native species. They may push threatened species to extinction. So there is documented research that about 42% of our threatened or endangered species are directly, their status as threatened or endangered is directly linked to invasive species. Um, some of our invasive plants actually increase wildfire risk and increase fire fuel. Uh, some of them are unstable in tropical events and they are difficult and expensive to control. Next. Here are some of the costs. Um, and these are some older data that we have available to us. So you can only imagine in the 10 or 15 years since this data was published that these costs have gone up. So in fiscal year 2010, 2011, our state spent $23 million fighting invasive plants. And the annual cost in 2005 in the US was 120 billion a year. And then if you think about just size or area, um, over 100 million acres, uh, an area roughly the size of California is considered to be suffering from invasive plant infestation. So that's a lot of area throughout our country. And there's the data on the 42% of threatened and endangered species affected. Next, this is just a great graphic representation of sort of what can happen in this world of invasive species. So um, the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is area of land occupied by a species that we could be talking about, for instance. So that lower left-hand corner is before the species is introduced into an area, so it's, it's absent. And this is when we want to do what we call early detection rapid response, where we are trying to prevent species from entering into an area where it could become invasive and could become a problem. We're sort of at this place with something called zebra mussels here in Florida. And if you're from the Great Lakes region, you've probably heard all about zebra mussels. I heard about them growing up and going to university in Buffalo, New York. Um, but they haven't really been a problem in Florida until recently where we were finding them in um, these moss balls in the aquarium trade. So people got really excited about their aquariums during COVID, spending a lot of time at home, and these moss balls got really popular in the aquarium trade. And what we found is they were harboring the larva, which was pretty small. You could really not, really not see it in the moss balls, but harboring the larva of zebra mussels. And so if people are then cleaning their aquariums or dumping their aquarium water out, we are now unintentionally introducing zebra mussels into our Florida waterways, which we do not want to happen. So the FWC um, put out quite a few notices. Um, they're working with the aquarium trade. There's been a huge push to not introduce these things into our state so that we do not have that problem here. So that's where we want to be in the prevention stage. It costs a lot less time, money, effort effort and resources to prevent a species from entering into a non-native area. Once you start um, going up that curve and you can see there's sort of exponential growth, uh, you still can manage the species in the eradication phase where you're trying to eradicate it and not have it in the area. But once the species get beyond that into containment and asset-based protection, you are now um, experiencing some type of economic, ecological harm or harm to human health. And you are also spending a lot of time, money, people power, um, and all sorts of resources to try to manage um, the situation and keep our natural areas um, restored or mitigating the effects that these invasive species are having. 
So the who determines invasive status in Florida legally, FDAX, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and the Florida Wildlife and Conservation Commission, which I just referred to as the FWC, they are um, the legal agencies that are determining status and regulating uh, these invasive species. In terms of gathering advice, information, educational resources, that's where the University of Florida IFAS Extension comes in. Um, certainly your local extension office can help you, but also I'm gonna talk briefly about the UF IFAS assessment on non-native plants. That's a great educational resource to find out more information. And then also, especially for today's topic, um, the UF IFAS Center for Aquatic and Invasive Plants as well. And then I'm briefly going to also talk about FLEPSI, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council list. Next. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the UF IFAS assessment now. It's research-based. It separates lists based on area of the state. So if you're trying to find out information about plants in the northern part of the state versus the central versus the south, that's how this is separated out. Um, it lists any plant on the state or federal noxious weed list as prohibited, so you will know which ones are actually prohibited. But then there are other categories like invasive, invasive no uses, high invasion risk, low invasion risk, and caution or not a problem species. So there's a wide range of plants on the UF IFAS assessment. So it's going to give you great information about if you're looking to plant something, um, can you plan it or should you not plan it in South Central or North Florida? And this is continually being updated. Plants are evaluated and assessed and then reassessed as needed. Next. So I'm going to show you an example of what um, the UF IFAS assessment looks like. These are the actual North Central and South demarcations on the Florida map, and they correspond roughly to the USDA cold hardiness zones as well. Next. Um, and it's also nicely color coded. So the plants that you really shouldn't be using or are prohibited to use are going to be red. Uh, the caution is going to be yellow. These are going to be moderate risk or um, plants that should be reassessed every two years. And that's about 14% of the plants on the list. And then 60% of the plants on the UF IFAS assessment list are actually considered not a problem species, which is great because those are the ones that you should consider planting. Next. So this is what it looks like when you first um, go to the website and we'll provide these links to you, but you could also just Google UF IFAS assessment and you will get there. You'll land on that page in the top left corner and you can just type in a species name or you can look at all the results and you'll get what you see in the bottom right corner there, which has, of course, some of the invasive plants like our rosary pea, but also has plants that are have been assessed and are considered not a problem species. Next. Um, so here's just an example. If you're looking up the oyster plant, um, you will get a page that gives you information that looks like this, and it will tell you based on those three different regions in the state of Florida. And you do need to pay attention to that because, for instance, this one, it's not considered a problem species in the north. Um, it's documented not a problem species in central Florida but it is considered invasive with no uses in South Florida. So depending on where you live in the state, it's gonna make a difference whether or not you're gonna consider planting this plant. Next. So there are some of the links um, that we have talked about and I will share those in the chat box in just a few minutes. Next. And then I just wanted to show you this because this is also another list that is out there and available. Um, and this is updated every two years. It's also divided into central, south, and northern zones in Florida, as you can see, um, as you can see there with the C, S, or N. And so FLEPSI category one plants are considered um, invasive exotics that are altering native plant communities. So these are the really bad guys. 
And then the category two are ones that have increased in abundance or frequency, but have not yet altered Florida plant communities. So in terms of this list, the, the category two, I personally wouldn't plant them, but they're definitely the watch list to be paying attention to. Okay, next. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Abby Turna. Thank you for being here with us today, Abby, and it is all yours. Hi, thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? All right, so thank you, Catherine, for that awesome introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you about different aquatic plant species, which um, I'm going to refer to as macrophytes. And specifically, I'm going to talk to you about the top 10, or excuse me, the top seven most invasive macrophytes in Sarasota County stormwater ponds. So I get to be here because I work a lot in stormwater ponds. I help communities assess um, the health of their stormwater ponds. And one way to do that is to look at um, how much or what is the abundance of invasive species, not only the number of different species, but how much area do they take up. And there's a, there's a rule in Sarasota County that invasive species can't take up any more than 15% of the total surface area of a stormwater pond. And so keep that in mind as I go over these seven most invasive macrophytes. So I'm using this word macrophyte, and you're probably like, what is a macrophyte? A macrophyte is a great way of lumping together different types of aquatic organisms. Specifically, we can lump together um, large algae that you can see with your eyes and also um, plants. So in general, macrophytes Macrophytes are large plant-like organisms that grow in or near water and are large enough to be seen with the unaided eye, so with the naked eye. Um, and they are usually broken up into um, habits of growth formation. And so we are going to talk about upright portions of the plant that are above the surface, which are known as emergent. And then we're going to talk about plants that are totally below the surface of the water, which are known as submerged. And then we'll talk about plants that have leaves that go to the surface of the water, but their roots and other structures would be below the water. And then finally, free floating plants, which are just plants that float on the surface of the water are unrooted and can just go with the wind. So I wanted to be here to talk to you about macrophytes in general and invasive ones specifically because Actually, where we live in Florida, and I noticed a lot of you live in different places, but where we live in uh, West Central Florida, macrophytes are a critical component to stormwater ponds. And that, that, is, that holds true for um, a lot of the state, but it's specifically here, and I'll go into why in just a second. But their functions are plentiful. So some things that macrophytes do for stormwater ponds, um, which is really important, is that they reduce erosion by stabilizing the shoreline. And that's really important because like I said, I go out to communities a lot and I work with communities to try to stabilize their banks because what they find is that they're losing their um, land to the pond due to erosion. And so one way to shore up your shoreline and to prevent um, shoreline erosion and create more stability is to plant um, macrophytes both um, in the water and on the shoreline. They also do a good job at taking up nutrients and so they outcompete or they can um, at least strongly compete with um, algae so that you don't have persistent algal blooms. Um, they can reduce turbidity and they also provide wildlife habitat. I think um, I should have put in a slide in here. Um, I'm a wetland scientist and so my heart and my passion belongs to wetlands. And if you look at any old aerial photos of um, Florida and Sarasota County specifically and West Central Florida um, region, you would see that the, the landscape was dotted with wetlands. And so wetlands have plants, lots of plants. They occupy a probably 85% um, or more of the surface area and um, have very little open water. And these wetlands were plentiful along the landscape and they were super important to water quality. And so if we can get our stormwater ponds to function more like wetlands that used to be there 
um, then I think we do go a long way for not only providing that habitat service, but also go a long way to enhancing water quality for the state. And it's important to also recognize the fact that in our area, specifically West Central Florida, there are um, lots of ponds. We, in, in Sarasota County, we have 6,600 and counting. And those ponds already have lots of naturally occurring nutrients. So I'm talking about um, different forms of phosphorus and different forms of nitrogen, which are important nutrients for plant growth. And since we have lots of nutrients, we should have lots of macrophytes in these water bodies. And so when you're looking at what is in those water bodies, you need to know the difference between invasive and native species. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you more about today. And so I don't expect you to read these two maps, but what I do want to just point out is the red zones are where we live in West Central Florida. And red is correlated to a pretty high um, total phosphorus zone and also the highest total nitrogen zone. So like I said, we have lots of nutrients in our area, which leads to the growth of lots of macrophytes. That is the normal natural state. So I told you that we're gonna talk about macrophyte growth habits and um, here we go. So we have emergent, um, which are rooted in the sediment, but most parts are above the waterline. Then we have submersed, which are rooted or anchored in the sediment with um, most or all parts below the waterline. And that might change in um, the wet season versus the dry season, but definitely going to be submerged at some point. And then we have um, floating leaves, which are, they, they put their leaves and their flowers above the water line, but all the other structure of the plant is below the water line and they are rooted or anchored into the sediment. And then we have free floating plants. Um, these may have roots below the water line, but they're not anchored. And they um, have most of their parts above the water line and can just um, basically go with the wind. So macrophytes um, emerge typically occupy the shoreline. So we're looking at this diagram up in the upper right hand side and you can see that emergent plants um, occupy the shoreline and then you'll have some anchored free floating. You'll lower down, you'll have some submerged. And then um, you can also have just regular free floating plants that are unanchored all throughout because they move with the wind. And while this is a very linear figure, what I wanna show you is down below this is what um, a typical littoral zone, and a littoral zone, just um, to give you a definition, is that shallow water area and um, an aquatic system. So if we're talking about ponds, it's usually um, less than five feet in depth. And it's um, shallow and light can penetrate all the way to the bottom most often. And that is where you'll get, um, you can occupy that zone with lots of plants. And that's a really important zone for um, all those services that I just talked to you about. But if you only have one plant in that zone and you have low heterogeneity or you have um, a monoculture is another word for it. And that means if anything happens, any kind of disease strikes or um, any kind of pest is there, then you're gonna wipe out your entire littoral zone and you're gonna lose all those functions. But if you build in heterogeneity or you build in diversity of plants in the littoral zone, and you, what you'll see is that it's not as linear as the diagram above. And I just wanted to point that out, that you could have immersed plants scattered throughout. There could be floating plants behind them. Um, there can be some scattered, submersed plants. But what's important is that you do have a makeup of all these different plants so that um, we can disrupt um, invasive species by building in this strong set of diversity. So I'm going to talk about that a lot as a way to prevent um, invasive species, it's, it's not, um, it's, it's one way to prevent invasive species. It, it doesn't um, always do so, but it definitely helps to grow um, a lot of different diverse macrophytes. So we're gonna start with emergent macrophytes in Florida freshwater systems. And this is a snapshot of just some native plants. And so it's important that you see some native plants because sometimes some of these native plants are thought to be invasive plants and they certainly are not. Potentially um, we can maybe call cattail in some instances a nuisance, but it is um, a native plant and um, 
It actually has a lot of habitat value and a lot of other functions. And so there are some emergent, so remember most of um, their, their structure is above the waterline. And so here are some invasive macrophytes. And so I'm gonna talk about the highlighted or the bolded three at the top, alligator weed, torpedo grass, and Peruvian um, primrose willow, or also sometimes known as water primrose. I'm gonna talk about those in a minute. I'm not gonna talk about wild taro, West Indian marsh grass, but just notice that they are uh, emergent invasive macrophytes. Next. Submerged plants. So these are plants that are um, usually below the water line. And these include things like tape grass, pondweed, coontail, and bladderwort. And so these plants, these submerged macrophytes, are extremely important to um, the health of pond environments. They do a lot of ecosystem services, like locking in um, sediments, taking up nutrients from the bottom of the pond. Um, they also provide a great amount of habitat, and they're often, um, I, I go to ponds, so I guess I have a problem because I go to ponds that are problems. <laughs> so I get, I get called out because there's an issue. I don't get called out when they're like, hey, look at this, you got an amazing system. So I might have a little biased perspective, but I do see a lot of times that um, when I get called out for problems, the problem is that um, managers, pond managers, are actually controlling for these native submerged macrophytes, meaning that they are, are killing them and targeting them with their herbicide sprays. And this is a problem because when you don't have these plants, you have the inverse. And um, that is usually a pond that is full of um, planktonic algae. And so you need to have um, these plants to clear up the water and um, to take tie up nutrients and and that is really important. So um, you definitely want to ensure that your pond manager is keeping these plants, these native ones. Now let's look at the invasive variety. So I'm gonna talk about in more detail hydrilla, just one of the um, invasive macrophytes in Florida freshwater systems. Next to the floating leaf plants, so again, these are these have some structures that are rooted into the sediment below the waterline, but they send up leaves and flowers above the waterline. And such um, native ones like water lily, spatter dock, and American lotus, I can't tell you how many complaints I get over spatter dock, that middle plant. Um, people do not like the look of spatter dock. And um, if you have a shallow water system, then spatter dock can um, usually utilize um, up to 10 feet and so they can spread across a very shallow system. 10 feet is probably extending um, their preferred area a bit, but they can grow pretty deep and um, they have a very hardy root. It's amazing if you ever pull it out. It's um, very huge, kind of looks to me like a pineapple, <laughs> but much bigger and elongated. Um, but a major root system, and they do, they can live in a wide variety of um, water conditions. So spatter dock is very prevalent in this area and probably a lot of other areas, but it is a native plant. And it's really important to all those other services that I mentioned. And then we're going to talk about this invasive floating leaf plant known as crested floating heart, which I've also seen here locally. It's in the top seven. Moving on to free floating plants, these plants might have roots below the water line, but they um, are mostly above the water line in their plant structure and they move, they're free floating plants, so they move along with winds and currents. And these are all native um, free floating plants. And so a lot of people also don't like to see any kind of duckweed in their pond. They think it's algae and they also think that it needs to be removed, but it is a um, one of the smallest floating leaf plants, not as small as the one you see on that finger, which is Wolfia. Um, that is um, the smallest um, floating leaf plant, I believe, um, in the U.S. And then um, some of the invasive free floating macrophytes include water hyacinths, which I'm going to talk about. And uh, Dr. Lynn Geddes is from U.S. and she is on this webinar today, and she has done a lot of research. I'm going to present just a smidget of it um, today. And then also water lettuce is another 
one that I'm going to talk about because it is very pervasive in Sarasota County. I won't talk about these other, um, this other type of duckweed that is an invasive type and also another type of um, salvinia that is also invasive, but just note that they are there. So let's get into it. We're going to get into emergence first. So I'm going to talk about torpedo grass, alligator weed, and Peruvian water primrose. So first, um, torpedo grass, Panikin ripe, ripens, which is from the Posier family. I just want to say that I'm a hydrologist by training in the wetland sciences field, <laughs> and so I'm going to butcher these um, botanical names, and I hope that is okay with you. If anybody ever wants to speak up and let me know how to actually pronounce it, please do. So the distribution of torpedo grass, according to EDMAP, um, shows that it is mostly in the southern United States and it exists in just about, if not all, of Florida County. It also is in Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, a little bit in Georgia, South Carolina, and just a smidge in North Carolina. And so um, torpedo grass can grow up to three feet tall and it has a hairy leaf sheet and hair on the upper margins of the leaf. The leaf blades are stiff, linear, and, and they can be flat or folded. The surface is often with a waxy whitish coating and they actually appear to be kind of silvery or um, a lot of people think it's like a blue green. I think it looks very silverish and that's how I can tell it from its um, native counterpart, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, torpedo grass has botanical type and fluorescence. You can see that in the very right um, in the middle, in the middle and the very right. And so those um, flowers are yellow and they're very small yellow. They're called torpedo because they have a very sharp um, leaf blade that looks like or a torpedo. The spread of this grass is limited to the rhizome. So either um, by rhizome expansion or by fragmentation. So when it breaks apart, if you don't get it all out of the soil sediment, you can actually spread it through fragmentation. Um, researchers find that seeds do not germinate well under Florida conditions. So it is spread then um, mostly by expansion and fragmentation. And so here, it can be easily confused with maiden cane, which is um, from the same genus, um, the Panicum genus. And so the main difference is you can see that torpedo grass has that, some people say blue green. I think it looks very silvery, like it's growing old age. Um, and then the maiden cane is very bright green. And you can also see the, um, the inflorescence on each is a little bit different in the way they're structured and then also the yellow flower on the torpedo grass is a little bit smaller than on the maiden cane. It is easily confused. Um, definitely needed to take out the book, um, but I do think it's basically that very sharp end to the leaf blade and also the silver of the leaf blades. So its regulatory status is that it's a category one, so it's an invasive plant with no uses. So what's the problem? Well, you can see in the picture that it can create quite a monoculture, um, and when it does that, it can block drainage. And what I find the most interesting about this plant, um, which I've been trying to control um, in many different places, is that it can just grow in the middle of other plants. So if you have like a bunch grass, it can just grow right through the middle of that bunch grass. And then you have to make sure that you then target it with an herbicide that does not kill the thing that it's growing right up in the middle of. Um, it also has some problems with, um, so human problems include, it can impact infrastructure. It then um, can also create um, recreational issues because you might not be able to recreate, um, fishing, boating, etc. And it's also a problem for golf courses, which is really interesting. So golf courses are also battling um, this invasive weed and then citrus groves are also battling this invasive weed. Um, by 1992, torpedo grass had taken over about 70% of Florida's public waters. The largest inf infestation can be found in Lake Okeechobee, where it's just 
place close to 7,000 acres of native marsh plants. And so that is a huge ecosystem problem. Um, it costs about $2 million a year to control for fl flood control systems. Um, and like I said, it is impacting industries such as citrus and golf. Um, and the denseness of the mats can be so great that they can impede the flow of water in ditches and canals. And um, like I said, that, that can block drainage. Let me show you the denseness. So this was me going out doing a pond. Um, I was looking at actually pond sediments and pond plants, looking at how they take up copper this summer. And I came across this dense mat of torpedo grass and pennywort. And let me see if this video will play. So the water is underneath it, and I was able to stand on this. You, you guys see the video playing. I'm basically just poking it with a stick, and it's just bouncing up and down on the water surface. Um, so I don't know if this is what would be considered a floton, but when I was in grad school at Louisiana State, we would go visit these floating um, marshes that were floating on methane gas, and um, you could stand and walk on them. And I was able to stand and walk on this for a while until I stood still. And then um, I, I sunk and that was a lot of fun to try to get out of. Um, but that's how dense these mats can get. So um, what is the Integrated Pest Management Approach or IPM for controlling the spread of torpedo grass? Um, the first thing is that you wanna prevent the spread from fragmentation of the rhizome. So that's really important that when you do whatever you decide to do, that you try to get out the entire plant or that you are able to um, get a herbicide, a systemic herbicide that can go down to the rhizome. So the first thing um, UF recommends is to control infestations near waterways. So if you're going to do, um, you know, if you're going to look at where to control first, waterways are important because that is one way to um, contain the spread. If you're mowing, be sure to clean off machinery to prevent the transport. Um, you can try to have good species diversity, like I was talking about previous to, previously, to deter infestation. Um, that did work in our bioswale. Um, we basically had it as a monoculture crop, and then we um, regraded the whole thing, and then we planted um, 35 different plant species. And then we just played whack-a-mole with it for a little while as it popped up in different places. We used a systemic herbicide that was um, experimental at the time, but um, it's now um, has um, use for aquatic use, and that's the thoxidem or tiger, and that was really useful. So now we don't have torpedo grass in our bioswale. So having a good uh, mixture of diversity, diverse plants and also going at it with a um, a very controlled herbicide was extremely helpful. Unfortunately, there's no current biological control other than cows and goats um, do eat it. And so, I don't know, maybe you can get a goat on your property to eat some torpedo grass. I'm not sure how good that works because again, they do spread through the fragmentation of rhizomes. Other um, chemicals that have been rated as excellent for removing torpedo grass include glyphosate, mazepure, and cethoxidin. And that um, we can share that um, fetus document, which is a document put together by Dr. Enlo and others to talk about um, the rating of different herbicides on these different invasive plants. Next, I'm going to talk about aller alligator weed. So this is one that I'm just not going to pronounce. Um, and that's just the way it goes. You can see the genus and species names there. And you can see the distribution. This is much more widely dis distributed than torpedo grass. Alligator was thought to accidentally be introduced into Florida waters in 1894 through ballast waters. That was something that Catherine talked about before. and can now be found growing throughout the state of Florida and many other southern United States. It's a rooted perennial plant that grows in a variety of habitats. Although it is usually found in water, it, it forms falling mats over deep rivers or along shorelines and can be a pest on land. I've seen it um, on land as well as near water. So I've seen it in pretty dry areas around um, Sarasota County. 
So some of their its characteristics is that um, it can grow to a depth of six feet and it has an emergent to about one foot. Um, so that's so there's a submersed variety and there's an immersed variety. So it can be totally underwater and then it could also go above the water line. And these are two, I don't, and Dr. Lingettis is on the line. So I don't know if she knows, I'm sure she does know, but I don't know if it's two different subtypes or if it's the same subtype that just has different growth habits, which um, I find amazing because I've seen them both in Sarasota County. Um, but its leaves are simple and they are about four inches. They have um, tooth or they have smooth margins and um, they are opposite. They have hollow stems, which is really useful in looking to ensure that what you have ID'd as alligator weed is actually alligator weed. Um, it has a very distinctive white papery flower that you see in the upper left-hand corner. And um, what appears to be one flower is actually a cluster of several flowers that grows on a stalk that's about or can be up to two inches long. Um, the seeds of this plant also don't do well in Florida, so they don't, it doesn't usually germinate in Florida by seed. So it is a federal noxious weed, so it's illegal to transport, cultivate, sell, or trade. If you need plants for research, you have to get a permit. Um, it is a Florida noxious weed. It's also a Florida prohibited aquatic plant. And it's a category two on the Florida Invasive Species Council list, which is really interesting. And, and category two just means that it's increasing in abundance, but it, it has not altered ecosystems. And if I'm wrong about that, um, let's double check that. But um, that's what I found last night. And then it is a prohibited plant um, under the IFAS assessment. So what's the problem? Um, similar to torpedo grass, it has thick mats that can prevent drainage in canals, ditches, and streams. So it, it blocks drainage. Um, it also can obstruct um, bridges, dams, and um, sharp bends and waterways due to how it can pile on top of each other in the thick mat. It also increases mosquito habitat, which is not good in Florida. It can obstruct recreation, such as fishing and swimming. And um, it, while maybe a small fringe of it could be beneficial to fishing, um, these dense mats are certainly not beneficial to fishing. And so the integrated pest management approach or IPM for um, managing, or, or excuse me, managing alligator weed would include um, preventing the spread by removing and disposing of the plant properly. It spreads easily via fragmentation. Um, so there's not really a recommended physical control. There are three insects for biological control that were introduced in the United States. Um, there's I, I think that was a mistake, so I apologize for that fourth bullet. Um, and then the chemicals that were rated as excellent include amazepur, triclopper, and this. Sorry, I can't pronounce that. So hopefully you can, or you could find it at a place where they sell herbicides. Privian primrose willow um, is the next on the list. Ludwigia provenia, and it's um, commonly found in swamps, lakes, and pond margins throughout Florida. You can see that it's also found in other um, places in the southern United States. It blooms all year, and so you've probably seen it. Um, it is not native. It is native, excuse me, to South America, but it is not understood if early records from the southeastern United States that date back to 1844 to 1864 imply that it's actually native to South Carolina or if it applies that it was found in South Carolina. So there is some um, unknowns about that, but it is known to be native to South America. So there are about 30 species of 
Ludwigia in um, Florida, and they are all known for their yellow flowers with four to five sepals and petals. And so um, this one can be easily confused with a lot of its um, other species. And some of them are native and some of them are invasive. And so this one is an invasive one. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot known um, or researched about this plant to date that I could find through University of Florida. Um, one thing that it, it's easily confused with its native counterpart, and you can see on the left, the native Mexican primrose willow looks very much like the non-native invasive um, Caribbean primrose willow. And so um, that is a um, easily confused plant. I think that the stem of the Mexican primrose willow has a red tint to it, while that is not true of the Caribbean primrose willow. The leaf of the Caribbean primrose willow from recollection in the field is that it's kind of hairy and soft, and that same does not go true for the Mexican primrose willow. So the regulatory status of this is that it's a category one and the ICAS assessment says it's invasive with no uses. Um, I see them on the shorelines of stormwater ponds and they usually occupy a good percentage of the shoreline if not managed. And that is a problem because it is out competing then for native plants that have actually a habitat um, service. I, I'm not sure because there's not a lot of research on this plant whether or not these plants provide any um, uh, habitat services, but certainly the plants that were here before that one um, would definitely be good and well suited for birds and other wildlife of Florida. So again, it's a monoculture that displaces native species and then it can block access to waterways. That is the problem. Um, so, like I had mentioned several times, there's not a lot of research on this plant. Um, I did want to bring it to the attention of this group because it is um, one of those plants that is under early detection and rapid removal. So, we could actually um, stop the spread by being aware that this plant is on the move in our shorelines of our stormwater ponds and we can mechanically remove it as much as possible. We can also build in that good species diversity along the shoreline to deter infestation. There's no current biological control. And um, if there are no other trees that you want to keep around, then you could use the Mazapure as a chemical to remove it. But again, it is possible to remove um, mechanically. So that is a recommended approach as much as possible, as well as building in a good species diversity to help deter infestation. All right, so next in the top seven invasive plants or macrophytes in Sarasota County around stormwater ponds is hydrilla. So this is a submersed below the waterline plant, hydrilla verticulata, verticulata excuse me, um, as seen here, can grow very rapidly. And this is um, some of Dr. Geddes's work. Um, and really, she has a whole lot of great stories about this plant. And if you ever get the opportunity to hear specifically about this plant from her, please do. Um, a lot of fun, fun stories. Um, I'm going to just talk about the distribution and some of the other things that I've already been talking about, the characteristics and how to hopefully prevent it, um, prevent the spread. So it is. Um, originally from southern India, but you can see that it has distributed across much of the United States. It was introduced in Florida water bodies in 1950, so not too long ago, and it was thought to have been introduced to Tampa and Miami areas as an aquarium plant. And by the 1970s, it was established throughout Florida waters and in most drainage basins. Hydrilla can grow to the surface of waters at depths of 25 feet and form dense mats um, and can still and can still be found in all types of water bodies today. So even with a lot of control, it can still be found in all types of water bodies today. Here are some growth characteristics. Um, it's submersed, profusely branched, herbaceous perennial with stems up to 20 feet long. It's an obligate wetland plant 
and it can grow into 25 feet deep of water. It has small strap-like pointed world sawtooth leaves. Its flowers, only females flower, and they're solitary, tiny white, and they float. Um, you can see that on the upper right-hand side. Um, their reproductive turions or buds are in some of the leaf axles, and you can see that in the hand. Um, so they're readily reproduced by fragments. Singular tuber can grow to produce more than 6,000 new tubers per square meter. So they are very prolific um, in uh, regeneration and growing. And you can see that it has these five petals. Um, that is my hand, because this is how I try to distinguish it. I just pull a plant from the water and I see if it has this characteristic five star shape, then I know that it is hydrilla and not one of its lookalikes. It is a Florida noxious weed, so it's illegal to transport, cultivate, sell, or trade. It's also a prohibited aquatic plant. Um, it is a category one because it certainly has altered lots of ecosystems. When you think about springs in Florida, it's hard to think about springs and not think about hydrilla and the havoc that it has wreaked on spring ecosystems. And it's also a prohibited plant under the ISIS assessment. So the problems are many. Hydrilla has a wide scale impact on Florida waters and is highly adaptable to a variety of growing conditions. It can grow in almost any freshwater system. Um, including tidal areas. Hydrilla can grow, like I said, up to 25 feet. It can grow in as little as 1% of sunlight. Hydrilla continues to be sold though, can you believe that, through aquarium suppliers? And um, even though it's prohibited, um, each stem on a hydrilla plant can grow to one to four inches per day. Therefore, when hydrilla invades the water bodies, um, it can just outcompete and, and also overtake native submerged plants, such as the other ones that I introduced, like pond weeds and tape grass and coontail, they can be faded out um, by hydrilla. Hydrilla can also um, change the water chemistry just due to how thick they grow. Um, they can also, for anthropogenic reasons, they can um, slow the flow of water, create flooding, and then boating interference. Um, Hydrilla is a powerful plant that we spend lots of money to control in the state of Florida. So how do you prevent the spread? Um, it's important to clean off boats, trailers, diving gear, anything that goes into water that you have hydrilla. Um, so I go kayaking in springs or if I go kayaking in freshwater systems where I see hydrilla, I make sure that I use that hose that usually those places have to clean off your kayaks and if you don't have a hose it's really important to try to use a towel to get off any kind of plant parts from your gear and your your boat um, you can do a, a for the integrated pest management approach you can um, couple some approaches um, raking and drawing down the water simultaneously can help remove hydrilla mechanical harvesters um, can um, actually have plant parts that stay behind and help spread the weed. So that's um, a really big problem. There are established insects for biological control and um, some of them have worked to varying degrees. Triploid grass carp can also control to some extent, but again, a lot of times when you have any part of the plant that stays behind, it can just um, regrow. Um, herbicides are mixed with um, results and they only provide temporary control but some of the ones that are rated as excellent are shown there. It's important to um, spread the word about hydrilla. Don't use it in your aquariums. That's really important. Um, all right, so next I'm going to talk to you about crested floating heart. Nymphoides cristata. And here's the distribution, much less distributed than hydrilla. Nymphoidae species have escaped from the ornamental plant trade. As you can imagine, it's a very beautiful species, but it's beautifully taking over. Um, it's an exotic plant that 
um, was sold in nurseries and water garden trade. It comes from Asia. Of um, it's, it's very rapidly spreading. It occurs in South Florida canals, stormwater treatment areas, several central Florida canals, and into North and South Carolina. The introduced species may look just as lovely as the native species, but it can quickly cover the water surface and a canopy of leaves and shade out plants below. And so that is one of the major problems. Um, so some of its characteristics is that it has a six inch leaf that is dark red marking. The leaf is very smooth, but the flower is a rigid white flower with five petals. You can see that there's like a white line or a right white ruffle down the center or the middle part of each petal, which distinguishes this plant from some of its lookalikes. And so you can see that here too. So let's look at some of its lookalikes, um, include yellow floating heart, water snowflake, banana lily, and then you can see the crested floating heart on the right-hand side. Um, so it is a federal noxious weed. Um, it is prohibited aquatic plants. It's a category one because it has altered ecosystems. Um, and so that is part of the problem is that it, it creates a monoculture, it displaces native plants, and obviously if the waters look like that, it's very hard to recreate in them. And so you can prevent the spread. It, that is critical for this plant at where it is right now in that invasive curve. So again, um, make sure that you clean your boats and that you talk to garden enthusiasts about not using the plant. Um, there's nothing found on physical control of this plant because it has the ability to regrow from the root crown. And so it's important to take out the whole plant. Um, there's no current biological control and some of the excellent rated um, chemical controls are listed there. Um, next, we're talking about free-floating invasive plants. We're going to end with water hyacinth and water lettuce. Oh, so a lot of this is also by Dr. Lynn Geddes. Um, so water hyacinth, you can see there, has that beautiful purple um, flower. It was introduced from Brazil to New Orleans in 1884. By the 1950s, it had infested 100,000 acres of surface water. Hyacinth and lettuce are difficult to manage because they're constantly moving. Because again, those are free floating plants. They can move with currents and also with um, wind. So the two species are the highest priorities for maintenance control. Here is some distribution. Um, they do also infect California quite a bit as well as all the places you see on the map. They're widely grown as an ornamental plant still, and they're available online for purchase. Um, reputable stores will not ship to states like Florida and Louisiana, but unreputable ones are out there. Um, these plants are not very cold tolerant, so they do die back in most of the states where they cannot um, survive over winter, and in some parts of Florida. Um, they're not salt tolerant at all, and so they're limited to fresh water. They produce seeds, but most of the reproduction is vegetative. So some characteristics, um, it's from South America, like I said, Brazil. It's from the Amazon River. It floats on the surface of the water. It's dark, feathery roots, not anchored in the soil, so it can easily move around. It's up to four feet tall, but usually shorter. It has rubbery roundish leaves that may have a point at the tip. There's swollen spongy petioles attached at the base of the plant. They have a showy purple flower, which are produced almost all year round in South Florida, but mostly during spring and summer in other parts of the state. They produce dense water mats. And again, Dr. Geddes has some really great stories about this plant and how much trouble they can cause for infrastructure. Um, they can be mistaken for um, this other plant, Limnobia spongia, um, because they have very similar leaf structures, and also pickerel weed or Panaderia cordata, um, because they have a very similar flower color, but different leaves and um, different flower on the other one. So they are a Florida noxious weed, they are a category one, and they are a prohibited plant. 
um, in the state of Florida. Oh, they have so many problems with um, blocking the air and water interface, um, which is a problem with interfering with the penetration of light and oxygen and water. So that could be a problem for fish and other aquatic critters that need oxygen to survive. The submerged plants that grow completely underwater need light to photosynthesize. And obviously, um, if you have a lot of this plant, then you will not have that light that you need to photosynthesize. They create monocultures, which is poor habitat. Um, and so they also interfere with us as well. They interfere with our ability to um, recreate. They also interfere with human health because um, they can create stagnant water, which is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And so when we think about the integrated pest management approach, um, again, this is from Dr. Geddes' research that um, herbicides plus biocontrol can cut the rate of your herbicides, specifically 2,4-D, in half um, from 120. 28 ounces per acre to 64 ounces per acre. So that is a good approach. Herbicides plus mechanical harvesting can be a great approach. Um, drawdowns of the water if possible. A lot of times that's not possible. Plus herbicides, you can also wait for the dry season. A lot of times naturally occurring systems have a very, um, have a very strong drawdown in the dry season. And so on, says Dr. Geddes. So you can see um, this a graph which showcases um, the dry biomass um, per tank of this plant with no herbicide. Um, and there's the orange is insect absent and the blue is insect present. So you can see insects are not doing too much on their own as far as dry biomass to control this plant. But when you couple the insects, you can see this blue bar here with um, herbicide, you get much greater control and so much reduction in biomass. So um, common questions that Dr. Giddes often gets about um, this plant is that herbicides lead to detritus. So why don't we let the plants live? But we can't do that because we have to harvest them. Um, herbicides can prevent off-target damage, um, like killing native plants. It's poison. Hyacinths are good for habitat for fish, but none of this is true. Um, you saw what kind of havoc they can do. They are decorative, but they can take over and they can create such a huge problem for infrastructure and for recreation and for other native uh, fish and plants. And um, I think they might be eaten by cows. So we can send you all of this information if you are very interested in water hyacinth and learning all about um, these common misconceptions and learning about control, we can certainly do that. Last but not least, water lettuce. Water lettuce is everywhere in um, Sarasota County, and it is um, distributed across Florida and some other parts of the United States. It's from Africa or potentially South America. Um, there is some disagreement as to whether or not it is native because if it's not, then it was introduced here pre-1765 because there is this drawing by um, William Bartram that describes this plant in Lake George of Florida. So it describes water lettuce and has a little picture. And so, so some people think that either it was introduced in 1765 or it was a native, it's really hard to tell. But what we do know is that it can take over and it can occur in lakes, rivers, canals, and it can form large dense mats. And it can get quite large itself as you can see on the left-hand side. As the name implies, water lettuce resembles a head of lettuce. Water lettuce has very thick leaves. The leaves are light, dull green and hairy and are rigid. There is no stalk, there's no leaf stalk. Water lettuce roots are light colored and feathery, and the flower is inconspicuous, monocot, perennial, free floating, except <clears throat> when stranded in the mud. Um, so you can see that it looks very much like a head of lettuce. It's very easy to identify in uh, the state. It is a noxious weed. It's a category one because it can um, definitely alter native plant communities and it's prohibited. 
So what's the problem? Um, it can, it's the same as um, water hyacinth. It can block air and water interface. It can reduce oxygen, eliminating underwater animals, which is a huge problem. It can cause stagnant water, and it also can breed mosquitoes within the actual leaves themselves. Um, it can cause a recreational problem because of how big they are. It can um, cause human health issues, like I said, because of mosquitoes, and it can restrict flow and irrigation canals. So lots of problems with water loss. And how should we control it? Um, maintenance control is probably the most easy. You can actually just mechanically harvest it. You can pull it out. Many um, stormwater professionals in Sarasota County use mechanical harvesting as a method um, of removal. It's a very effective method because it's easy to pull out the entire plant and you don't have to worry about fragmentation or anything like that. There have been two insects that have been released in the United States as biological control agents. Um, and oftentimes herbicide is mixed with um, mechanical harvesting. So those are the top seven invasive aquatic macrophytes in the state of Florida. I hope you learned something about them, especially how to identify them and some ways in which you can think about controlling them. And Catherine is going to take us home. All right, that's exactly what I was gonna say, Abby. I'm gonna bring us home with a few final slides. Um, so just a quick overview about thinking about integrated pest management of invasive species. Next. So Abby's done a really great job about talking about this with each of the individual things she's covered. Uh, but basically thinking about um, how do we go about managing these species? And many of them, as Abby has talked about, are incredibly difficult to control. They're incredibly expensive and utilize a lot of resources to control once they get higher up on that invasion curve. So we really want to do that EDRR, that early detection rapid response for some of the species that maybe aren't already infesting our um, local waters. So also we wanna think about changing cultural practices and providing education like we're doing in this program. So, you know, changing cultural practices, think about the aquarium trade and what I talked about earlier with those moss balls and what do we find aesthetically pleasing? What are some of the practices that we're doing culturally? Maybe some of our boating practices or some of our lawn maintenance practices and just the idea of cleaning our uh, our mechanical um, transportation devices and things like that. So uh, a number of things fall into this category of changing cultural practices, as well as providing education so that people really understand what an issue this is, which is one of our main goals and objectives of this series that we're doing is really providing information about why this is an issue, how to help prevent some of these issues, and then also helping people identify some of these plants on their own and on their own properties. And then after you do that base work, if you're still continuing to have a problem, then we start talking about some of the control methods. And we always wanna start with the physical control methods. Then we, and we often use these in conjunction with each other, but at first, if we can do something physically like pulling the plants or removing the water lettuce, like Abby just talked about, that's a great, um, opportunity to try to manage these. Biological methods are, and if you want to go to the next slide, Abby, I'll just keep talking through this. Biological methods are when we use biocontrols or living species to help control. And so on this slide, I have some of the ones that I usually talk about in my presentation, which is, for instance, the air potato beetle that you see in the upper right there. Um, but our biological controls are often uh, biological organisms that existed in the native range of these plants that kept the plant's population in control in the native regions. And before these things are ever released into Florida ecosystems, they are studied for upwards of 10 to 20 years. They go through um, tons of studies at the actual research labs where they aren't released out into the ecosystems um, prior to release. And only once they're found to be very specific and very safe are they ever considered for release. And of course, that's all monitored by multiple agencies, including the USDA. But these biological organisms can retard growth. Um, they can slow down the distribution and population of these plants. 
Um, next. And then of course, our sort of last resort is gonna be our chemical treatment options. And I know one of our guests on our program today asked a question about this or made a comment about the use of chemicals. And of course, we always wanna to try to do everything else we can before we get to utilizing chemicals. But the issue with invasive plants are once they have taken hold and they're further up in that invasion curve, we can't always manage them with some of the means that we'd like to be managing them with. And so sometimes if we want to take into account the bigger picture of maintaining our Florida ecosystems, um, maintaining our native plant communities and the biodiversity that is so important, we may need to resort to chemical treatment. And then we want to be very careful about what we choose, how it's applied. So I did put the link in there for the research article on herbicide efficacy in aquatic plants, um, which is the information that really helps provide um, an opportunity to choose herbicides that are gonna be very, very specific to what you're trying to treat. And then of course, you always wanna follow the label so that if you are choosing to use chemicals, you're utilizing them correctly. Next. So ways you can help. Uh, if you want to learn more or get more involved, there are what are called cooperative invasive species management areas throughout our state. These are regional multi-agency collaborative efforts to provide education about invasive species, but also um, prior to COVID at least, there were opportunities to do public work days and things like that. So for our region that Sarasota County is in, it's the Suncoast SISMA, which I am a co-chair of. And so that SISMA um, is Pinellas, Hillsborough, Sarasota, and Manatee County. But you can find more information if you're from a different county on the link that I have on the slide there. Next. Um, also, EdMaps, that's where the maps, the distribution maps that Abby was showing, um, where she got those. And so there's a lot of information on EdMaps uh, for you about all types of invasive species, not just aquatic plants, but terrestrial plants, as well as animals that are invasive. And also on EdMaps, you can find the I've Got One website where this is a reporting opportunity. Uh, where if you do have invasive species, especially ones that we are concerned about managing or doing EDRR for, um, the I've Got One app or website is a great opportunity to report invasive species that you find so that we can track them and perhaps send people out for things like Burmese pythons. Next. And then, um, of course, University of Florida has a lot of scientific-based, research-based um, information for you to utilize. The EDIS documents are um, all written by professors and researchers and faculty at UF IFAS and Extension. Those are some of the, uh, the documents I've put links to in our chat box for you. Um, so you can just Google EDIS and um, there's a whole invasive species topic within there that have all sorts of documents that you can utilize. Um, this non-native plant book that you see in the bottom left-hand corner, that's a wonderful resource uh, where I get a lot of information for the webinars that I do on invasive species. And then um, there's a quick little laminated guide. And of course, when we're talking about, if we're talking more about landscaping our yards, um, you wanna think about Florida friendly landscaping and uh, looking at removing the invasive plants as well as planting natives and Florida friendly. Florida friendly isn't completely just native plants, um, but also includes plants that we don't consider to be a problem here in Florida. So we call them for Florida friendly. Uh, that guide that you see on the screen there is available for free for, to you at your Sarasota County Extension Office and some of the other extension offices throughout the state, but I believe you can also find it for free online as well. So consider shopping at native plant nurseries, join your local native plant society. We've got a couple people on today that I know are part of our um, native plant society here in the Sarasota Manatee Charlotte County area. You can always reach out to your local extension office for assistance or to answer questions. Um, and of course, we wanna consider decreasing chemical use by planting our native plants and doing all those other steps in that integrated pest management plan. Next. So we wanna thank you.